When the space shuttle Atlantis rolled to a stop on its final mission back in 2011, it truly marked the end of an era. Few could deny that the problem had become too complex and expensive to keep running. But even still, humanity's ability to do useful work in low Earth orbit took a serious hit with the retirement of the shuttle fleet. Worse, there was no indication of when or if another spacecraft would be developed that could truly rival the capabilities of the winged orbiters that first conceived in the late 1960s. While its primary function was to carry large payloads such as satellites into orbit, the shuttle's ability to retrieve objects from space and bring them back was arguably just as important. Throughout its storied career, sensitive experiments conducted on the International Space Station or aboard the orbiter itself were returned gently to Earth thanks to the craft's unique design. Unlike traditional spacecraft that ended their flight with a rough splashdown in the open ocean, the space shuttle eased itself down to the tarmac like an airplane. Once landed, experiments could be quickly unloaded and transferred to the nearby space station processing facility where science teams would be waiting to perform further processing tests or analysis. For 30 years, the space shuttle and its assorted facilities at Kennedy Space Center provided a reliable way to deliver fragile or time-sensitive scientific experiments into the hands of researchers just a few hours after leaving orbit. It was a valuable service that simply didn't exist before the shuttle, and one that scientists have been deprived of ever since its retirement. Until 2021. With the successful splashdown of the first Cargo Dragon 2 off the coast of Florida in January 2021, NASA has regained a critical capability it hasn't had for a decade. While it's not quite as convenient as simply rolling the shuttle into the orbiter processing facility after a mission, the fact that SpaceX can guide their capsule down into the waters near the Space Coast greatly reduces the time required to return experiments to the researchers who designed them. In comparison, the shuttle could safely land with around 14,400 kg or 31,700 pounds packed in its cavernous cargo bay. But realistically, that capacity was intended for hauling satellites and was completely overkill for simply returning racks of scientific experiments. Price was also a consideration. A Dragon mission cost NASA just a fraction of what a shuttle flight did. Combined with a much higher launch cadence of the Dragon, it's clear which vehicle was better suited to performing regular milk runs up to the ISS and back. Sadly, there was a downside. Despite SpaceX's intention to one day perform pinpoint propulsive landings with the Dragon, the small spacecraft ended up splashing down in the ocean under parachutes, just like the Apollo and Gemini capsules before it. This meant returning to Earth on a Dragon was a much rougher ride than what the shuttle offered. While not a problem for many payloads, it could be a ruinous experience for sensitive experiments such as those designed to study crystal growth and microgravity. Further complicating matters was the fact that the capsule came down in the Pacific Ocean, several hundred kilometers off the coast. This made recovery operations easier for the California-based SpaceX, but as NASA lacked suitable payload processing facilities on the West Coast, returning cargo would need to be transported to Johnson Space Center in Houston or all the way back to Kennedy Space Center. The prospect of experiments potentially having to endure a cross-country flight before they could be released to scientists made certain research difficult or even impossible to accomplish. With a helicopter waiting to take time-sensitive payloads from the recovery ship to the space station processing facility, SpaceX can now deliver experiments to scientists a mere four to nine hours after splashdown. This is a major upgrade over what was possible previously, and arguably the best that can be realistically expected for an offshore operation. But it's still not as fast as the space shuttle. Ultimately, having to pull the spacecraft from the ocean and transporting the human crew members or scientific payloads back to land via helicopter will always take longer than simply landing the vehicle at a designated facility. Since SpaceX is no longer pursuing targeted propulsive landings with their Dragon spacecraft, 
That means another company will have to step up to meet the challenge of truly rapid payload return. As it so happens, that's precisely what the Sierra Nevada Corporation hopes to do with their Dream Chaser space plane. Currently slated to fly later this year as part of NASA's Commercial Resupply Services 2 program, the vehicle can return as much as 1,750 kilograms or 3,860 pounds of cargo to a gentle horizontal landing. Being a quarter size of the space shuttle orbiter, the Dream Chaser has the advantage of being able to use any runway that's long enough to accommodate a large passenger plane. Its launch site, landing site, vehicle configuration, mission duration, and other characteristics can be adjusted to meet the needs of different users. And because it doesn't use highly toxic fuel or require a specialized infrastructure, it can land on aircraft runways pretty much anywhere. And this offers us numerous advantages. For example, by getting payloads and astronauts returning from space to their final destinations quickly and safely. This ability to land essentially anywhere on the planet has clear benefits for international scientific collaboration. But most importantly, when the company completes work on their human-rated variant of the spacecraft, it could be a potentially life-saving capability in the event that a medical emergency necessitates a crew member be transported back to Earth as quickly as possible. What's more, the gentle trajectory during re-entry enhances the overall safety of the mission. It reduces the forces exerted on the crew and payloads, ensuring a smoother and more comfortable ride for those on board. This is particularly important for delicate scientific experiments or sensitive cargo that require careful handling and protection during the return to Earth. The ability to execute a gentle trajectory during atmospheric re-entry aligns with Dream Chaser's objective of providing a safe and reliable means of transportation for both crewed and uncrewed missions. It enables a controlled descent, minimizing the risk of structural or thermal stresses that could compromise the integrity of the spacecraft. Dream Chaser's runway landings enable a faster turnaround for subsequent missions. Once landed, Dream Chaser can be quickly prepared for its next mission, minimizing downtime and maximizing mission frequency. This agility and efficiency makes Dream Chaser an attractive option for rapid cargo resupply missions and time-sensitive scientific experiments. Finally, SpaceX says Cargo Dragon 2 is designed to deliver up to 6 tons to the ISS and return up to 3 tons to Earth. SNC says Dream Chaser will be able to deliver up to 5.5 tons and take back an unspecified amount. More importantly, though, Dream Chaser will use a larger berthing port and have substantially more space and volume to store its cargo, likely making it far easier for SNC to actually take full advantage of its theoretical performance. Because of its limited volume, Dragon 2 has never launched with even 60% as much cargo as it's theoretically capable of carrying. For NASA, the more a spacecraft's performance can be exploited, the cheaper a given cargo delivery effectively becomes. Despite all these advantages, there is a looming reality that Dream Chaser is still a loser compared to SpaceX Dragon. Up till now, Dragon still remains the only spacecraft in the world capable of routinely returning a significant amount of cargo to Earth. Dream Chaser spacecraft will now berth to the International Space Station no early than December 17th of this year. Previously, Sierra Space had been publicly targeting a launch of Dream Chaser in August on board United Launch Alliance's new Vulcan rocket. The shuttle-shaped Dream Chaser's ride to space will be a new booster from United Launch Alliance called Vulcan. Vulcan, however, is also facing development issues of its own ahead of flying the two certification missions. Before Dream Chaser, it is supposed to fly Astrobotics Lunar Lander on a CERT-1 mission in May but an anomaly during testing on Vulcan's upper stage has also occurred. The company has now determined the root cause of the anomaly as well as the required corrective action, which explains the destacking plan. Here's hoping that everything goes smoothly for both Vulcan and Dream Chaser. As the Boeing Starliner is teetering on the threshold of doom, the Dream Chaser, which was once considered its rival, just took a step closer to its first flight by powering up its systems in a key test. 
This is definitely a glimmer of hope in the realm of space exploration. Nearly a decade in the making, Dream Chaser is the next generation spacecraft under development by the Colorado-based airspace company Sierra Space, part of the Sierra Nevada Corporation, or SNC. Recently, the company announced their successful power-up of their revolutionary Dream Chaser space plane. During the test, engineers simulated the power that would otherwise be generated by Dream Chaser solar arrays once the space plane's in orbit and its systems are turned on. Sierra Space exercised flight computers, base processors, and low-voltage distribution units. Tom Weiss, Sierra Space CEO, said, This is a milestone that points to the future and is a key moment in a long journey for Dream Chaser. With this significant achievement, our Dream Chaser space plane is poised to redefine commercial space travel, opening up new possibilities for scientific research, technological advancements, and economic opportunities in space. The successful test was a key moment for the progress of space technology after years of design and development across Sierra Space, enabled by the accomplishments of many teams from system-level design to final assembly and test. The test comes as the company prepares to ship the first Dream Chaser, called Tenacity, to NASA's Neil Armstrong Test Facility in Ohio, the former Plum Brook Station. There, the spacecraft will go through thermal vacuum tests before shipping to Cape Canaveral for final launch preparations. Sierra Space did not disclose a schedule for those milestones in the announcement of the Powering Up test. Speaking during a panel at the 38th Space Symposium in April, Janet Cavandi, president of Sierra Space, said Dream Chaser would ship the test facility in the July time frame. She said the vehicle would be tested there for a few months before shipping to Florida. We should be ready to go by the end of this year. However, we should also note that the schedule will depend not just on the readiness of Dream Chaser, but also the manifest of missions going to the International Space Station, as well as the launch of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur rocket. Most recently, ULA announced it stood down from a key flight readiness test on May 25th due to an issue with the rocket's booster ignition system. Previously, Dream Chaser has been slated to launch on the second Vulcan mission, after a launch of its astrobotic lunar lander that had slipped to later this summer because of launch vehicle testing issues. In preparation for that launch, NASA astronaut Yasmin Mobelli and JAXA astronaut Satoshi Furukawa recently trained on Dream Chaser systems, including how to transfer cargo between the spacecraft and the ISS. Mobelli and Furukawa are assigned to the Crew-7 mission, scheduled to launch to the station as soon as mid-August, remaining there through February of next year. Dream Chaser will initially be used to transport cargo to and from the ISS through a commercial resupply services contract they have with NASA. Sierra Space, though, is planning other applications for the vehicle, including a crewed version. That DC-200 variant will be a little bit larger and have a slightly different outer mold line, Cavandi said at a press conference. In preparation for those future crewed flights, Sierra Space is planning to select its own professional astronaut corps. We will do that upon the successful landing of Dream Chaser, she said, with an initial group of 12 to 15 people. This news comes only a few days after the successful return of the Crew Dragon spacecraft, the second Axiom private astronaut mission, AX-2, that splashed into the Gulf of Mexico at 11 o'clock at night on May 30th. As we previously discussed here, the AX-2 mission highlights once again the commercial aerospace industry's ability to execute and operate successful space missions to the ISS. In a celebratory tweet, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk noted, 38 astronauts to orbit so far, marking the company's success, safely launching and returning astronauts since its first launch three years ago. Sierra Space is joining the club of a handful of leading entities offering innovative services to better the industry and make human space travel safer, cheaper, and easier. It's hard to think of a more exciting time for the aerospace industry, especially for human space flights, than today. The dream of being an astronaut is becoming more and more feasible. This is a milestone that points to the future and is a key moment in a long journey for Dream Chaser, said Tom Weiss, chief executive of Sierra Space, in a statement about the test. This company is completely persistent with their goals, unlike Boeing. In Sierra Nevada Corporation's version of the vehicle, it was initially envisioned to carry up to seven people to the ISS when it was competing under the NASA's commercial crew development programs. However, in 2014, the design was ultimately not chosen primarily because of lack of maturity, according to Aviation Week at the time. The space agency instead selected SpaceX's Crew Dragon and Boeing's CST-100 spacecraft, which are expected to make their first crew flights as early as the second half of 2019.
Sierra Nevada Corporation at the time was beginning to drop tests of the spacecraft prototype. The first glide, which took place at Edwards Air Force Base in California, performed well, save for a stuck landing gear at the end of the flight, which caused the test article to flip over upon landing. The company said the test was a success despite the landing gear issue, which was not the design that would be used for space-related versions as it was taken from a military jet. Following the NASA non-selection, the company continued development, looking for supporters and organizations that might use the crewed version, including a European company and the United Nations. As a result, it was the selection by NASA of a cargo variant of the design, called the Dream Chaser Cargo System, that ultimately breathed new life into the program in January 2016. The cargo variant is essentially the lifting body spacecraft, with foldable wings to fit in a rocket with a 5-meter payload fairing and a small disposable module at the back of the vehicle that could carry pressurized and unpressurized cargo. The cargo module would also hold solar arrays to increase flight time in space and support powered payloads, Sierra Nevada Corporation said. Overall, the design is planned to deliver up to 5,500 kilograms of pressurized and unpressurized cargo. It could also return cargo to an airport runway. The cargo module would be disposed with any unneeded equipment before re-entry. The spacecraft is being designed to be able to launch atop a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket or an Arian Space Arian V rocket. However, it's likely that ULA's Vulcan rocket, which is being designed to replace the Atlas V, would be able to support Dream Chaser flights as well. Ultimately, it's hoped each space plane could be used 15 more times, with a future crewed variant to fly at least 25 times. Talking about Boeing Starliner, although they announced in 2009 the company was making a substantial investment in the development of the Starliner, then known as CST-100, multiple sources have shared that's not the case. Instead, Boeing for a long time nickel and dimed the engineers spent working on Starliner. This was partly due to congressional underfunding of the commercial crew program, but also because Boeing didn't want to put skin in the game. Big difference. After all, hopefully Dream Chaser achieves their success soon. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget to share your ideas in the comment section below. Everyone's support motivates us to create more quality videos. And for that, we thank you so much and hope to see you next time. Bye.